uveitis. <laughs> um, so I think this one's the ugly. Uh, so this was a 16-year-old girl who was referred by an outside retina specialist here to the Moran seven weeks prior to her presentation here, so when her whole set of issues started. Her left eye was red and swollen, uh, in her and her parents' words. Uh, she had a little bit of pain in that eye and some blurry vision. She saw a local optometrist, they're not from Salt Lake City, uh, who started cyclopenolate and durazol, uh, each of them two to three times a day. Her vision got better, um, and then she stopped cyclopenolate and she stopped the durazol. She restarted them later, um, and it seemed like things were better with the drops than without them. Her parents also were taking her to see a naturopath close to where they live, so she was using colloidal, colloidal silver drops, which they flat out said didn't help, but they did use magnets taped to her forehead, which they think were helping things, so they kept those taped there. Um, they went back to the optometrist who thought that the iris was stuck to the lens. Um, sounded like posterior synechia had formed. Uh, so restarted durazol and cyclopenolate. The vision remained blurry, but on these drops, the eye was a little less red than it was before. Um, a little bit later, she developed what she described as a milky spot on the inferior iris. And then within a day, the entire front of the eye had become milky. So that was when the naturopath prescribed an herb to bring down the inflammation. But she ultimately um, saw this other doctor who actually referred her down here. Uh, a little bit of other history, she had a cavity filled four months prior to all this. Her mother, maternal grandmother had a history of rheumatoid arthritis, no other rheumatologic conditions we could elicit in their family. Review of systems was entirely negative other than her actual ocular issues uh, and, and the fact that the week prior to presentation she had achy shoulders and hands. But that was six weeks after her ocular symptoms started. Uh, she was a junior in high school from Idaho. She's traveled throughout the West, but not really too many other places. She has chickens, cats, and a dog, and no history of drug use, sexual activity, anything like that. So she was actually referred to Dr. Crandall here for an iris tumor. We saw her the same day. Uh, on examination, she was 20-20 in the right eye and light perception in the left eye. Her pressures were 13 and 9. Uh, pupil... Um, was six and dark and four in light, uh, and we didn't, by the time we saw her, she had already been dilated, so I'm not sure about an APD at that point. Uh, full field in the right eye, can't really even test it in the left eye. And then the right eye was essentially normal on examination. A few pigment changes on the fundus exam, but that's about it. So here's a photograph of the left eye on presentation. Um, I'll go through just a couple of these. There obviously won't be fundus photos of the left eye. Um, So I can't see because there's a big light in my face, but does anyone in that back corner want to describe what you see? I can see Conrad, he's sorry, you're sitting in the wrong spot. So <laughs> <laughs> just why don't you go on and tell us what you're looking at here. <laughs> uh, so see a nice, it's hard to say if that's like, well, a nice large white What about the iris itself? I know it's a hazy view, but you see, we'll see. Not there. So it almost looks like it's attached to this lesion, but it's hard to say. I mean, there's like distortion definitely along mm -hmm. the margin of it. And then here superiorly, uh, you have almost the iris there superiorly and then almost pulled strand it is hazy. It's, it's a hard view, and it was easier at the slit lamp, but there's some neovascularization of the iris there, and there's a little blood inferiorly in the anterior chamber, so she's bleeding a little bit in her anterior chamber as well. That white thing is inside the anterior chamber, and it's just a big white mass of what looks like an enormous fibrin plaque. That's what we were calling it. It did not look like an iris tumor to us, um, which is why I think Dr. Crandall asked us to get involved. 
Um, and then obviously she's extremely injected and we didn't really have a view of anything behind what you see in this picture. Um, so what are your all's thoughts at this point? Anyone, what would, where would you go from here? Um, what sort of paths can you take as far as what to do for this girl? Mm -hmm. uh, versus like an inflammatory etiology, but I would first start with the B scan to see what's going on, what you're hearing about. Yep, so B scan's important. And would you try to biopsy that, or would you try to rule out other systemic infections and let it quiet down in case it's really inflammatory and surgery would make it worse, or what, what are your thoughts there with this sort of a presentation? Mm -hmm. So you think it's endophthalmitis? That's one thing that we could consider, but it could be inflammatory okay. as well. Okay, yeah. That's, we'll come back to that discussion. Um, I don't know what I just did. Okay. So we were worried that this was just a really fulminant anterior chamber inflammatory condition and that surgery would worsen it. So we started with a big lab workup, including a chest x-ray among all the labs, and started her on Durazole every hour and atropine along with systemic antibiotics uh, to sort of cover ourselves, azithromycin and Bactrim. Um, and we did send her... She was. Um, we did start Valtrex. She was also sent to Dr. Harry. Um, an ultrasound showed vitritis, this AC collection, but no obvious iris mass. It didn't seem like there was anything on the iris hiding behind this that may have been seen before. No change over the next week with regards to vision and exam. All the labs came back negative or normal. Uh, so she was started on a prednisone taper along with calcium vitamin D. The acyclovir was started before and the azithromycin and Bactrim were stopped. She came back the next week and she went to no light perception in the left eye. The fibrin plaque was smaller. The iris neovascularization was still present, but it had improved. Uh, and the B scan showed a similar vitreous uh, debris, um, now a shallow RD, probably serous in nature. In fact, it was, because we, we saw the retina later. Um, and a thickened retina as well. So now we're really panicking. So we stopped prednisone that day, diagnostic vitrectomy that day, um, which was very difficult to pull off socially. Um, her father would not consent to the surgery unless he got the naturopath on the phone, and this naturopath told us it was an okay thing to do. So there were a lot of social currents going on that made this treatment difficult, um, in addition to the disease to begin with. Uh, so vancomycin, ceftazidine, voriconazole, and foscarnet were all injected. Um, the specimen was sent for multiple PCRs and cultures, and it came back with 2 plus listeria, um, also a PCR for Epstein Barr virus. So, listeria is not what we were expecting. Um, so, at that point, we got infectious disease involved from primary children. She was admitted for a full workup, including lumbar puncture, blood cultures, and IV antibiotics. Uh, she was continued on the Durazole now that she was being treated with antibiotics. The atropine, neofloxacin were continued. The val acyclovir was stopped. I don't know why this keeps doing that. Um, all of her studies came back negative or normal, so we didn't find any evidence of systemic involvement, although it came from somewhere. She was ultimately sent home on IV ampicillin, uh, switched to oral Bactrim. She got a rash from that, so she was changed to levofloxacin, and she seemed to do well on that as far as systemically. She remained no light perception in that eye. Her right eye remained unaffected. Uh, she developed a shallow AC. She had all these posterior sinica. Her pressure went up to 31 in one visit, but she had no pain. Um, and all the visits after that, her pressure's been back within a normal range, still with no pain. Uh, so Listeria's uh, gram positive rod, most commonly found in newborns, the elderly, and pregnant women, but it can be found outside of those demographics. And when it is, 
It's usually associated with the ingestion of something um, that's not prepared properly, uh, undercooked chicken, hot dogs, things like that. So we went back and asked her once we had our diagnosis, and they drink only unpasteurized milk, which is also a potential source of this infection. So that's likely where this came from, and that wasn't a question that we asked them from the outset because it's not part of what we normally think about. But that's probably the source. Just a couple brief case reports. There's not really a lot out there in the literature on this. There are only case reports. There isn't even a case series of two patients. Uh, so this first one was a 58-year-old man with diabetes, came in 2400 in one eye with a high pressure and a fibrinous anterior chamber reaction, um, started on everything possible to lower his pressure and had an AC tap. Uh, the next day, he was 2070, still had a high pressure, uh, started on antivirals and topical Predforte. The next day, he had a hypopion and a vitreous cell on B scan, so that's the picture of him on day three. He had a tap and inject with vancomycin and ceftazidime uh, and was started on antibiotic drops as well. Uh, the hypopion got larger, so he started on prednisone. The culture ultimately grew listeria. So the steroids were stopped, ID got involved, he was given amicacin intravitreally, uh, and he was also started on ampicillin. Then, he, then this turned into a mass, so this is starting to look familiar to our patient. Uh, he had an AC washout performed, and he actually got back to 2020, and he kept getting these recurrences, even though he was on these antibiotics for long periods of time. When they <coughs> stopped him, all this would come right back. So they'd restart him on antibiotics, and. At the time of publication of this paper, they still had him on Bactrim. They were afraid to take him off of it because every time they stopped it, this would come back. Um, he's a bit abnormal in that he ended up 20-20. <clears throat> Almost all of these patients that are read about ended up light perception or no light perception. Um, so this, this is not a good prognosis with this bacteria. Uh, there's another one with a 27-year-old man. Had had PRK six months earlier. Came in, was diagnosed with conjunctivitis, was started on tobramycin drops, his vision got worse, uh, and then ultimately um, was hand motion in the right eye, still with normal pressures. At this point, he had a brown hypopion. That's another thing that's common in these case reports. These patients have these colored hypopions, usually described as gray or brown. Um, ours had a plaque by the time we saw her, but I don't know what she looked like before. Uh, there was vitreous debris. He had a tap and inject. Uh, the culture showed, and I could hear our service screaming at this point, uh, gram-positive bacilli, but it was thought to be a contaminant, so it was thrown out. Um, so then the clinical course worsened, uh, had a repeat vitrectomy, um, and this time it grew listeria. Uh, and so started IV penicillin, but ultimately went to no light perception and developed tysis. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip the last case report that I have. Essentially, the last one I was going to talk about just showed that this is a systemic disease. That last patient developed meningitis and got really sick. Um, so uh, a nasty bug that didn't have a good outcome for our patient. Uh, back at the first decision branch point, you know, when we were worried about inciting worse inflammation in an already extremely inflamed eye, uh, vitrectomy was the right way to go. So I guess I wish Dr. Huang had been in the room at the time. Um, but what are the thoughts on that in the room? Does anyone have any strong opinions? I can't see who's raising their hand, but yeah. <laughs> I think it's both. People don't seem to really know, uh, but people get all of the above. Um, the common theme in these patients is they develop a horrible anterior chamber reaction that prevents the view to the back. Everybody always ends up getting a B scan that shows inflammation in the back. Sometimes they do a vitrectomy and they get a view to the back and the retina looks inflamed. Um, and sometimes they just do a tap and inject that's blind. So you never see to the back and then the eye goes into tysis. That seems to be the common theme, with the exception of that patient who ended up 20-20 on lifelong Bactrim. <laughs> so um, that's a good question. High pressure is a common issue. It wasn't for our patient, at least as far as we know. She might have had a pressure of 50 a few weeks before we saw her, and we just didn't know about it. But. Um.